What was it that led Jack Abramoff and over 80 congressmen and staffers to a mysterious chain of islands in the middle of the Pacific Ocean? This American territory seemed to be a conservative paradise. Close to cheap Asian labor, not subject to many American laws, the Mariana Islands were a neverland for Jack Abramoff and Tom Delaney. A place where business and free markets could evolve without any rules and regulations. The Marianas Islands is a Galapagos island of free enterprise. Before they went into inviting businesses to come, they were like an Indian reservation. They were totally dependent on the government. Their society was absolutely shredded. Uh, high alcoholism, high drug use, uh, huge divorce rate. It was just a disaster. And the people decided to bring in free enterprise, and uh, it worked. The free enterprise solution was to exploit special legal loopholes created for the Marianas. Local businessmen could open garment factories, import foreign workers, pay them far less than the minimum wage, and then ship finished goods to mainland America with the label made in the USA. This was a huge cash cow. If you operated out of sight, man, there was no quota, and you could pay the workers at that time. It was like a dollar something an hour. Over 40,000 foreign workers came to the American colony after Saipan, looking for opportunity. Even though the minimum wage here is uh, lower than the U.S. minimum wage, it's still very attractive wage for people from the Philippines that might earn a dollar an hour or people from mainland China that would earn less than that. And so properly administered, it was, it was a win-win situation. The problem is that there were some very significant abuses that were going on. laws of the United States were not applicable there, the fact that the labor laws, the minimum wage laws were not applicable there, you started to see uh, a, a perfect storm for those people who then wanted to exploit that. Before they go to Bangladesh and they talk about the Commonwealth and they say bring us to the Saipan and we can earn in money, a big money, near about $1,000 a month. So we pay them each $7,000. And you were recruited for Francisco Reno. $6,000. You end up with workers who had huge debts, and those debts were then taken out of their paycheck by the employer and given to the recruiter. And so they were basically indentured servants. These are your pay stubs? Yeah. Did you, but did you ever get money? Help them get you the money. money. You don't get the money? Yeah. Until you work 15 months with no pay? Yeah. Stories emerged of seven-day work weeks and 18-hour days. Companies kept files of runaways who fled because of rapes and beatings by some women were chained to their sewing machines. Pregnant workers were pressured into having abortions lest they lose their jobs. Passports were confiscated. They came there thinking that they were going to make a real contribution to their family income. Many of them did find work in the country, but others, what they found was something very different. So some of them found themselves in the, um, there was cocktail waitresses, and the cocktail waitresses became dancers, and the dancers were asked to participate in, in prostitution and it just was a downward spiral for these young women the exploitation went on for several years everybody chose to look the other way because of the influence that the ministry the Prime ministry has had over the years human rights groups began to investigate they secretly talked to workers posed as businessmen filmed factories with hidden cameras. Their reporting led to lawsuits, labor fines, and an attempt by Congressman George Miller to bring Saipan under greater federal control. There is a bill put to the House that they want to take over. Well, what are you going to do if that happens? To close the factories. Protecting Saipan's factories from government rules and regulations, this was a job super lobbyist Jack Abramoff. When I was governor, 
somebody introduced uh, Jack Evermore to you. Jack Evermore was pretty smart. I mean, <laughs> maybe he was too smart for his own good, but uh, the fact is he, he realized that we needed help in Washington, D.C. We hired Jack Evermore to lobby against the immigration bill. They figured that Jack Evermore would be the way to go because he had direct connections into the majority leader's office, uh, Tom DeLay. And Tom DeLay, if, if there's anybody in Washington, could influence legislation uh, on behalf of the CNMI. We were told that nobody could go through Tom DeLay without going through Jack Evermore, and it cost us millions of dollars. For their services, Abramoff and his firm, Preston Gates, charged the CNMI over $200,000 a month. Part of the plan was to mount tours to the CNMI by conservative writers and sympathetic congressmen like John Doolittle and Dana Rohrbach. We went out there to take a look at, uh, at some of these clothing factories that had come in from uh, various parts of the world in order to uh, set up operation there. And uh, it looked like to me that it was working. What they would do is take a quick tour of the garment factories and they diverge in the front doors of those factories saying, hey, there's nothing going on out here. I, we, we don't see any abuses. Uh, so what are you guys talking about? And what would they do there if they were going? R&R. &R. Generally, they, they would stay at the Hyatt Regency Hotel, five stars. There are at least five uh, championship uh, golf courses. At some point, Jack must have realized that that's how you sell the Marianas Islands. Um, you know, with this, this abominable labor, basically, indentured servitude, it's one step from slavery, but you bring people over there, it's beautiful, the golf courses, the nice hotels, <laughs> they, they, they fell for it. We've been out here a week now, and uh, I think that first-hand information will help us uh, maybe enlighten some of the others that haven't been pushing in the right direction. By day, they were sports and games. And by night, there were cocktails, cockfights, fights, and clubs. This thing about the Marianas is absolutely preposterous. And we didn't find anything that, that uh, was like is being described. And to suggest that I'm for sex slavery and human trafficking is ludicrous. One member of Congress after another was going out there looking at us saying, looks good to me. And Jack Abram was saying, I can help you. As a special take-home gift, Jack arranged for some of the touring congressmen to receive campaign contributions, often from local factory owners. Grateful congressmen acted as the Abramoff marketing team, promoting him to his clients. Let me just <clears throat> note with you the way Washington works. If you would have had a non-voting delegate, and they would have come to me and said, I want you to go help the president, I probably wouldn't have gone. Instead, you had, you know, whoever it was who hired Preston Gates, hired people who knew me and knew how the system worked to represent your interests. To show his ultimate power uh, and connection to Washington, uh, he said to us, you wait, I'm going to bring you Tom DeLay out here. And he did. I went as a guest of the government to see it for myself. I even went to the leading human rights advocate on the island. I can't remember his name, but it was a Catholic priest there and, and asked him to show me one case of a human rights abuse. There were none. He couldn't show me one case. Uh, all the lies that the liberals and George Miller told about the Marianas Islands were not there because I looked for them. Congressman Miller was the only one who actually wanted to meet with the workers. So he came in, and he was sitting in this, and not my caucus room, when I was in front of the caucus, with our translator. All of a sudden, out of my corner of my eye, I see this interpreter started to cry. And so I asked, tears rolled down her eye. I said, you have to tell us what he said, because making you cry, obviously, makes you cold to the congressman. 
And she said that she had asked her to tell Congressman Miller since he was such a powerful man and a, and a you know, federal elected official, could he please buy one of his kidneys so that he could have the money to go back to China? Could you buy my kidney? While in Saipan, Delay attended a party in his honor, hosted by Willie Tan, the largest garment factory owner on the island. I knew this kind of popular, and I saw myself as a really a farm that he had power. They can't even see uh, the light at the end of the tunnel. Willie Tan helped pay for congressional trips, arranged a factory tour, and sent hundreds of thousands of dollars to Delay's private foundation in the campaigns of President Bush and other Republicans. Jack Abramoff sought to frame the cash flow as a crusade for economic freedom. To help spread that gospel, Abramoff enlisted the services of his old friend, Grover Norquist. Thanks to Jack, money from Saipan Garment Factory started flowing to Norquist's think tank. As if on cue, Norquist started promoting the cause of the Marianas in his famous Wednesday war council for the Republican Party. How's it going in the Senate? What can we most effectively do to help? Some of China's factories in the U.S. territory in the Pacific suddenly become a free market issue. And so somebody said, gee, I always thought those places in the Marianas were Chinese sweatshops. And they go, oh, and, and if, if somebody disagrees with you, they will destroy you. <laughs> is not evil. Money is free speech. Money is involvement. And as long as it's open and transparent so that the, the electorate can see who's giving money, who's taking money, and how is it being spent, it's the system extremely necessary. They saw the booming economy. They saw free market system that Lord Tom Delay said was a petri dish for pure capitalism. But he never met those women. He never listened to their stories. He never saw them cry. He never saw the shame on their face and the humiliation that they felt. So we came back again with trying to say that at a minimum we thought Congress would change the minimum wage law and would change the, uh, the immigration law to protect these people. But that didn't happen in the House. Yes, there was a problem five years ago, but now we are forcing these employers to honor their contract. Every independent group that's looked at this has found it to be just the opposite currently going on in the Northern Marianas. What happened? Well, I know now what happened. I didn't fully understand at the time what happened. It turns out that you know the House Majority Leader, Tom DeLay, was running a protection racket to keep these people in business, uh, and his friend Jack Abramoff was their lobbyist. I was working through Jack Abramoff with the government of the Marianas Islands, and I came back and I stopped the Georgia. It's fairly simple. If you're in leadership, you can pick up the phone and call a committee chairman and say that bill's not coming out of committee. Well, Tom told us before that bill. Oh, Tom. And you know what he did? He called those guys. He called up the guy who was in charge of the committee and said, hey, Tom, you have to get a lot of Yeah, I know. Yeah. And they said, Tom, nothing wrong with the Sierra Mines. I said, you got to go there. Congressman Don Young did go to the Marianas. Protesting workers confronted him, but Young was unmoved. He helped delay block reforms. His reward? Thousands of dollars in campaign cash and fundraisers for no one. The Marianas were a money machine for Abramoff and Delay. Then suddenly, without warning, their favorite governor lost his re-election campaign. The new governor canceled Jack's contract, just like that. Facing the end of the road in the Marianas, Abramoff sought guidance from Delay's personal minister and former chief of staff, Ed Buckham. Buckham had a reason to want to come to the rescue. Thanks to Jack, Willie Tan had helped finance Buckham's new lobbying business, Alexander Strategy Group. So Buckham set to work with Delay's press secretary, Michael Scanlon, to fix a local election to make sure Jack got his contract back. 
Buckham and Scanlon needed two men to change their votes. Their first target was Alejo Mendiola from the island of Lowell. Ed Buckham and Mike Christian came over here to Saipan, and I brought them to Loda as a representative, and I took them to uh, the airport. Mendiola wanted $1.25 million for airport improvements. He voted for Jack's candidate in the money appeal. Next, as part of a fact-finding trip, it was Michael Scanlon's turn to flip a vote by offering up more taxpayer cash, courtesy of the delay operation. The delay operation knew how to work, what Jack called the paper cut. It's a committee where specific members or staff have an incredible amount of influence and ability to spend specific amounts of money in specific places. $150,000 from the favor factor was suddenly appeared to fund a study on whether to repair this breakdown. In gratitude, local politician Norm Palacios voted for Jack's money. That policy change that hope is not good with us. <laughs> that I don't know. <laughs> but I think it's not really good. The money worked its magic. Jack's friend Ben Fidia was elected Speaker of the House, and Jack got his contract back. There were two senators who changed their votes in exchange for projects on their island. Did they get anything for switching their votes? I don't know. But they I weren't involved. They did anything. Did Tom Delay's office give anything? I don't know. And I wouldn't know. Wouldn't he? Fidio had sung happy birthday to Tom DeLay in the Whip's office. He signed an email to Ed Buckham, who adopted brother Ben. Fidio also made sure that Buckham got an energy contract in the Mariana for a special client from DeLay's district, Panama. Uniting factor, Jack Abramoff. Let me tell you about Jack Abramoff. Whatever he did after he left the Northern Mariana, I cannot condone that. I mean, obviously he did something wrong because he got convicted. I mean, now I understand he's in jail right now. <laughs> but let me tell you that Mr. Abramoff did what we retained him to do. Without him, this Commonwealth would not be what it is today. Today, the garment industry has all but abandoned Saipan. New worldwide trade treaties have eliminated the Marianas loophole. Factory owners have moved on in search of the cheapest labor money can buy, leaving behind environmental disasters, rootless immigrants, and a thriving sex trade. That is what capitalism looks like when you turn it loose. So that's why we have a regulatory state. And when you take the regulations away, as lobbyists like Abramoff wanted to do, the Marianas is what you get. Native American gaming is highly political. It is an $18 billion industry. As in the Marianas, Jack's Indian business was built around a loophole, a 1988 law that gave the right to have casinos on tribal property. Successful tribes such as ours must have the help of qualified, honest professionals that understand the business and politics of Native American gaming. To protect their gambling profits, tribes turned to the man who convinced them that he had many influential people in his pocket. George Walker Bush was solemnly sworn that I will faithfully execute the office of President of the United States. So help me God. Congratulations. Jack had raised lots of money for Bush and convinced his tribal clients not to contribute to Bush's key Republican rival, John McCain. In 2001, Abramoff was asked to bring his lobbying practice to the same clinic that Bush had had to win the Battle of the Florida Recount, Greenberg Trout. This is a house that Jack can clearly had a big practice, five or six million dollars. The Marianas, the Mississippi Choctaw, the Louisiana Cachadas, he was making the big push for the Saginaw Chippewa. How do I have to trust? Uh, and he is, you are not spending the money to get back, you know, with the multiple. Last year, uh, Choctaw, these were, I think, like, uh, three and a half million dollars uh, in terms of uh, lobbying fees, and they got 120 million dollars in direct and indirect federal help grants. 
Suddenly, Jack was a popular man in Indian country. So was Grover Norquist. He gave the Indians political cover, casting casinos as enterprise zones. In exchange, Jack made sure that the tribes donated to Grover's think tank. I'd love to work directly with Indian nations. There's some good state think tanks uh, around that, that uh, put out good work on why we shouldn't be raising taxes. Ralph Reed also wanted a piece of the action. He cashed out of the Christian Coalition and wagered his reputation on a new money-making venture. I'm going to be forming a new company called Century Strategies. Century Strategies, a consulting firm with a powerful grassroots network, played a key role in Jack's Indian casino business, working with one tribe to shut down the gambling operations of another. Louisiana Control is one of his biggest clients. This is a small tribe of several hundred people that have a very successful $300 million a year casino, and they are very protective of their turf. The Cushada hired Jack to prevent another tribe, the Jenna Band, from opening their own gambling operation. America has a moral crisis that it needs to confront. What we believe is one of the greatest cancers growing on the American body politic, and that is the scourge of legalized gambling. Which and this is a man who says he's anti-gambling, yet he's being paid by these tribal casinos to shut down other casinos, not because he wants to shut down casinos, but because they're paying him incredibly well to do this. But it would look bad for Reed to take money from casinos. So Jack steered some of the gambling money through Grover. And Grover took a cut. Reed's Century Strategies would rake in nearly six million dollars in Indian gaming money, and he'd be paid, you know, through a, another organization. One or two entities removed, so that Ralph Reed is not the money. Abramoff got Ralph Reed to not only mount public opposition to this plan, but to put pressure on members of Congress, who then put pressure on the Department of Interior to prevent the Jena tribe from opening a casino. It was very interesting to us in Indian country when a letter came out signed by a number of representatives to the Department of Interior saying, please stop what the Jena band was trying to achieve. Most members who signed the letter opposing the Jena casino got campaign cash from competing casinos. did not get their casino, and Abramoff won and, and defended the interests of his client, the Kushada. Jack used tribal money from all his Indian clients as a piggy bank to send over $5 million to political causes and candidates, mostly Republican. Some of the biggest recipients were Bob Nance, Tom Dale, John Dewey, J.D. Hayward, Patrick Kennedy, Conrad Burns. Jack Abramoff was so skillful at convincing a lot of Indian tribes or companies to donate all kinds of money to political candidates and political parties as he saw fit. And so, yeah, Jack Abramoff was a huge rainmaker, one of the largest rainmakers in town. Everywhere we went, we mentioned the name Jack Abramoff. Everybody knew who he was. The taxi cab driver that we took mentioned Jack Abramoff, and now he was a man. This is a guy with some power and some connection, especially on the right. And frequently he'll get phone calls and he'll say, hey, this is Tom DeLay or it's uh, Carl Rove, something like that. Whoever, you know, uh, big name in the White House. The President of the United States. I can remember being at a dinner where Neil Volk sat at the table with me, and he pointed and said, Jack's going to be up on the dais with the President tonight at one of these Republican galas. And I looked up. Jack Abramoff was up there. That gave him the feeling that he can do anything he wants because all the right people are in his pocket. Abramoff saw himself as larger than life. 
figure, not only at the lobby, but he was the worst on tour. Jack had a slogan for his restaurant. There were no portions in a conservative setting. If you were a Republican, Signature was the place to go. Any night of the week when it was hard to get a drink there, you had to shove the bush staffers aside. Trust me, they were bellied up to the bar uh, at the trough at the best of them. And it's placed at Neil Bolt's and his friends hung out at. At Signature, we were able to walk in, be treated like royalty, and it's like, hey, Mr. Bull, this or that, free drinks, free food that you could throw to your friends. I've seen Jack out at lunch with uh, two black girls, one in each hand. Uh, laptop, the Wi-Fi, the, everything from a corner table in the restaurant. And obviously it's his restaurant. So you kind of got to, you know, walk through Rome to get to the Colosseum and he sees it. Abel Moss also had four guy bosses. So he had an assistant whose principal part of her job was doling out tickets for these guy bosses. And they were going to members of Congress and their aides. That big suite at FedEx Field, right in the middle of the, the stadium, was just a knockout. Jack had all the tools in the lobby toolbox. He walked out of Central Casting as the lobbyist. As millions rolled into Greenberg Trolley, the law firm gave Abelmoss extraordinary freedom. Bent its many rules and made special allowances for Jack's unique relationship with a former staffer from below, Mike Stanley. Stanley left for his office and immediately was seen as somebody who Jack was very close to. They were always conniving. They were always scheming. In some ways, they were like a uh, Casey version of the producers. A few weeks ago, you mentioned something to me. I took the concept and I put together a plan that will make serious money. 